Okay, so um, we're talking today, the company Convolt, you recently um, published, I guess, the results of a survey to do with Kubernetes and storage. Um, uncovered a lot of interesting points. The one to start with maybe is about the level of internal application development. What, what sort of statistics, what did you find out about that for starters? Yeah, it, it was an interesting report, Phil, because um, where we were in our journey is we were talking to customers, we were attending events like KubeCon, and we were getting really spotty results. We were, you know, there were customers or businesses that were at the very beginning trying to figure out how, how do I spell Kubernetes? What do I, what do I do with this thing? And then there were others who had gone in and developed, they were running in production and they were looking for the fine tuning. Um, so as an organization, you, we issued this study really to try and understand where are businesses in this journey and what are the right things, whether it's education, whether it's feature functionality, whether it's enhancements, what are the right things to go focus on? Um, and this study actually exemplified what we were seeing, which is everybody's at different phases of this journey. Um, and internally, we've been calling there's sort of been two inflection points that we've been focused on. The first one being technology, which is, okay, there's this shiny new object, you know, how do I, how do I use it? What do I do with it? And then the second one is a maturity inflection point, which is now that I've done something with a shiny object and I wanted to get real business results, now comes the reality of governance and sovereignty and resilience and all the other things um, that really allow a business to bank, you know, on a new way of doing business. Um, and so we've kind of plotted out these two points on this graph and interestingly the survey highlighted the same thing that there are different organizations across verticals across geographies at different points and what was really interesting is that there are sort of two there are two personas in this space that are really driving the momentum there is the engineers the development engineers who are looking for agility easy on-ramp make it fit in my framework and then there's sort of IT ops who are saying, yeah, now that you've made it work and you're doing these great things by you know, writing your applications in a containerized way, it's portable, you can move it to and from the cloud, you can get fast results, but I've got all these boxes to check. I need to make sure that I'm you know, compliant and I need to make sure the data is protected. And so, so it really highlighted that. And I think the real things that we took away from that is the reality of hybrid multi-cloud in the containers ecosystem is a, is a very, very real one. Um, as an example, one of the things highlighted was the number one ask on an RFP is, do you support multi-cloud when I'm looking at containers? You know, and so that, that was the first thing that many customers were asking for. And, and another one that was really interesting was in deployment, 71%, I think it was 71, 70, 71%, of deployments of containers are hybrid. They live between a private and a public cloud. And I think that was great for us to hear, to validate where we believe the puck is moving to, but also there's so much work that's being done in this space and so many dots are connecting at the same time to make this a real business value. And, and that's really what we got out of that survey. Okay, and in terms of the actual sort of backup and restore piece, if I'm right, the survey revealed that companies, individuals, at least they, they told you that they like to think they'd got a pretty good understanding of backup and restore, but I'm guessing maybe that's backup and restore in general and maybe not so much to do with containerized, containerized apps, but we'll, we'll get on to that. That's right, that's right. Um, and that, that's really what it was, you know, as you're saying, what the results did highlight was many businesses just thought, you know, I know how to do backup, I know how to protect, I've done that for everything else, I'll just do it the same way with the containers. Um, and what was missing was, Yes, but not quite, right? Like it's the, there are a lot of subtleties because with containerization, what you got was rather than having this monolithic blob of stuff that was all the things related to your application, you could worry about it as one entity and back it up. That's, that's not by definition what containers are, right? That the idea is you break it up, it's all fragmented, you change what you need and you build it like Lego pieces into the actual entity that you want. And so it was actually almost a scary uh, revealing from, from the survey, which is there was almost an overconfidence of, yeah, I, I know how to do backup. I'm just going to apply the same thing to containerization and I'm good to go. And it was actually like, no, 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 hold on. Think about it. You've taken advantage of these Lego blocks instead of a full structure at this point. Now your Lego blocks are dispersed. You've got one in each corner of the room. How are you protecting that? You know, or you're reusing the same Lego block for different structures. How are you protecting that? And I think the idea of secret keys and manifests and persistence data and all these other things that kind of come into play when you think about applications living in a containerized world, 
those were being weren't being thought about in that way. So it was great that people are thinking about it. They feel like you know businesses feel like they've got their arms around it, and it it is top of mind, which is awesome. Uh, but it's a little scary because it's almost like a knowing enough to be dangerous, but not enough to to have fully checked the box, right? So it, it's that it's that phase that we're in. And in terms of the number of people doing that, I, the, the survey, what did it discover in terms of the um, the sort of use of containerized microservices? How many apps were using, sorry, containerized microservices architecture? That's a bit of a mouthful. But <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was huge. You know, so so the numbers split out almost um, a third each between bare metal virtualization containers today. And then actually, if we throw the puck out about 24 months, containers grow. So they become the, the large lion's share of how applications are developed and deployed, actually taking away, you know, I'll call it share from virtualized environments. And so the numbers are staggering, right? Because what it tells us is more and more, whether it's, you know, databases was the first one that, that businesses highlighted through the survey as, as containerizing, uh, but also as more and more cloud native applications are built, they're all done in a containerized environment. And so if you throw the puck out two years, you're talking about a majority over 60% of everything running in some form of containerized environment. And that's between production and dev test. And you know, it gets even scarier when you look today because the majority of dev test is now already done in containerized environments. So virtualization bare metal is already falling by the wayside there. Okay, and in terms of the applications, another sort of aspect, how many did you discover are stateful? So in other words, I guess they, they themselves store and retain the data. That, that was a, does that pr produce sort of any interesting information? Yes, it, it does. It does. You know, if we if we look back at where containers started, it was very much stateless. Um, you know, I don't need to worry about storage. I don't need to worry about protecting data. Um, and as we went through this survey, it really highlighted, you know, as I mentioned, databases as being the first use case or application that's really been containerized, heavily stateful. Um, the second one was really anything that is using a cloud native environment. So again, those were all aligned to stateful applications. And the third one that is starting to build, build up momentum, which is heavily, heavily stateful, is, is actually an, an analytics AI type workloads, because now you're talking about masses of data, masses of state um, that are needed as these applications are becoming containerized. So in fact, the top three in the survey were all stateful applications. And that really highlighted the fact that we have seen a shift in the market. You know, when everybody was dabbling, sandboxing, and figuring out what to do with this shiny new object, okay, we didn't really think through state and we didn't think about the data or the food that this application is, is using to really yield good results. But now you know, databases, AI, analytics, these are all heavily stateful applications and thinking through what you need from a storage perspective, where that's gonna live, you know, in the cloud, on-prem, in at the edge, in some combination of, is really highlighting stateful applications, persistent data, and, and that's starting to become a big focus even at KubeCon last week in EMEA, um, CNCF have had loads of articles about it. So it's really becoming very real. Okay, and in terms of what did you discover with um, what people were doing with Kubernetes? Uh, firstly, I guess around orchestration of these con con sorry, containerized workloads, what did you find? I think it's become one of those, you know, there were, there were several options for orchestration when containers started out. Most people I talk to now will make containers and Kubernetes, I mean, there's almost synonymous words with one another, you know, you, you, you interchange them because Kubernetes has become the de facto way of orchestrating containers. Um, and again, if we look at how that's kind of blown out, it's, it's open source, it's heavily driven by CNCF, uh, you know, a large community behind it to really drive that forward. Lots of standards and specs being created to make sure that vendors are all able to tie their technologies into this to really create a robust environment. And Kubernetes is in the middle of that, right? Whether it's CSI drivers or uh, whatever they're sort of developing through the community, Kubernetes is where people gravitate. That's where you start to understand how do I use all these resources and what is the real value of elastic scale and repurposing what I might have for compute or for storage or for anything else? And how do I do that in a way that I can use my existing stuff. You know, I've already made an investment in this storage or I've already made investment in these servers. How do I build those into an orchestrator like Kubernetes um, and simply click, 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 you know, or, or write a YAML file or whatever your preferred um, approach might be to use all these environments. And, and I think Kubernetes has done a fantastic job of doing that. And 
and like I said, I think using containers without Kubernetes or one without the other at this point is, is almost useless because we've all just mentally mapped them together. And is there also a correlation? I mean, if they're using Kubernetes to orchestrate uh, the workloads, are they also using Kubernetes to protect uh, the data and the applications as well? Does that sort of follow naturally? It does, it does. So there are CSI drivers, which is essentially the way in which um, there's a standardization for how vendors can plug into Kubernetes, whether it's for storage or for protection. Um, and so, you know, as Commvault, that's something we're very focused on making sure we're compliant, staying up to date with the latest releases, et cetera, and, and even supporting the extensions. But I think as we talk to vendors and, and customers now as well, they're also following that. They're going to Kubernetes as the safe place to understand containers and understand how how do I make this all fit together? You know, it's, it's a lot of piece parts. How do they come together? And I think Kubernetes is really driving that and extending into persistent volumes for storage, into protection, having a spec out like CSI to make sure everybody's compliant is allowing businesses to onboard Kubernetes and make it a production grade environment, right? Where everything is thought through and the connection and the hooks are in there as well. And in terms of the, the sort of methods and tools people would be using for the data protection, did you find there's a whole range or other one or more that are particularly sort of popular? What was what was the sort of findings there? Yeah, it, it's fairly broad at the moment. Um, you know, the, the statistics did show that there, there's a fair amount of customers that use a cloud native approach, you know, so, something with a public cloud and they'll just plug directly into that layer. Um, but it's constantly evolving. So it's not a pattern that we're able to see any repeatability out of. It really depends on where did that particular business start? Did they start in the cloud, in which case they gravitated towards a cloud native approach? Or did they start in you know, maybe a little more on-prem and therefore they've been onboarding, they've had a cloud first strategy, they've got preferred vendors, but it, it's really all over the map right now. And I think that's really the opportunity for education. You know, That allows us to all learn from each other that, okay, you used this composite of tools um, that gave you these outcomes, these results, this agility and time to market, how does that replicate itself? Or how do we find ways to build this into something like Kubernetes or you know, other standards through someone like CNCF who is looking to try and get a level playing field to make sure that, that businesses aren't at risk, right? And they've got the right choices um, and they can make those based on their business requirements. Okay, and you've, you've mentioned the cloud quite a lot for obvious reasons, because you know, everyone's sort of heading there, basically. But in terms of what you found out, the sort of hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, I guess they're slightly different sort of approaches. So what did you discover in terms of how people might have been using one or other of those approaches, or even both, to the containerized apps? I think they're, they're, they're non-negotiable. Um, you know, what the, what the statistics told us was the majority, so 71% of deployments for containers span a hybrid cloud, so between a public and a private cloud. Um, and these are these are also the production use cases, right? So that's what we're seeing that already um, anyone that's looking at containers for production is headed in the hybrid cloud model. Um, the second thing the results highlighted was the number one RFP ask was, do you support multi-cloud with containers? So the I think both from what we're hearing back anecdotally and what the survey highlighted, there are numbers to reflect the fact that when we're thinking about containers and we're thinking about the data portability aspect of containers that that gives you, that that's sort of the value behind it. How does that fit when it comes to the cloud, right? And, and it breaks all sorts of boundaries. I, I use the analogy of, you know, when you have a brick of ice, you, you know where the boundaries are, you can see it, like it's clear. Once that melts and you've got water, now you've got a little puddle. Okay, you can kind of sketch out where the boundaries are now that that evaporates and all bets are off, right? Where did it go? What happened to it? Who can see it? What did it touch? And I think that's really what it highlights that yes, cloud brings all these benefits and it's huge. The pandemic has highlighted that, right? Endpoints have become real. Um, but how do I still do that while making sure that I'm not risking my business in any way? I'm not going to be the next you know, article in the paper for a ransomware attack or a data breach or, you know, pick, pick your pick your nightmare, right? But how do I make sure that my biggest asset, that data is still protected and doesn't become a liability or a risk for me? And I think that's what has become very real, that cloud is a part of it, containers is another part, but how do I make these two work together without risking my business? And we, we talked near, near the start about the, the fact that the, the survey respondents seem to be comfortable or confident that they were you know doing a good job around storage data protection 
but I'm wondering, you know, you alluded to that, I think, but wondering whether they were clear as to, you know, containerized environments versus non-containerized, um, you know, how were they coping with those those two different environments? Were, was their confidence backed up, as it were, by what they took? you found out or was it actually they were kidding themselves they thought they were doing a good job but perhaps they weren't yeah so so what the survey actually highlighted was was one in four um you know thought about it, it was it was back of mind um they hadn't even really considered what what they were going to do um the other three quarters they were pro they sort of fell into three buckets you know there were there were a small subset that really had understood this they'd architected in a way that protected their data and they thought through how that was going to work and then you had the lion share in the middle that was somewhere in between that if you got to a 101, 201 conversation, they understood protection as one entity, they understood containers as the other, but stringing those together was where the gap was. And the large, you know, lion share about 60% fell in that middle category, which was, I've got some ideas of these two, I've got skill sets within my organization that understands one half or the other, but not that much skill set that gels the two together. Um, and I think that was really the realization of that's why I'm stuck in this space where I see this great technology. I've got it in dev test. It's working beautifully. I'm getting results, but I'm hesitant to pull the trigger and go into production because I don't know what I don't know. Right. And I think that's what really highlighted for us as an organization that the biggest value here is, is not in selling. It's actually in, in educating. Right. It's in uh, getting us all on the same on the same page in terms of when you are thinking about this yes you're doing this and therefore that means don't forget to consider this thing over here um you know so we've spent a lot of our time sort of pivoting to more of an education focus with our customers at uh, industry events like kubecon to really show up and say look with our knowledge of backup and what we've seen from our customers here's some things you might want to consider right and, and think about this as you're architecting your solution i think the results just really highlighted that for us that now there's numbers to prove that education and those dots connecting between protection or storage and containers needs to be pulled closer together. Okay, and I want, I mean, I sort of followed the storage industry for a, a fair while, and there was a bit of a, I suppose, confu well, confusion, but no, complications when the, the physical world was joined by the virtual world. You know, there was obviously, you could back up physical storage, and then there's suddenly this virtual storage to be backed up. So that caused a certain amount of uh, confusion. Then obviously there was the sort of cloud native storage, which you know, had a certain, uh, benefits and now I'm guessing that the holy grail here is something that sort of does physical virtual and containerize one single data protection suite is, is that available uh, I'm guessing it's desirable but is it is it you know, available as well it is it is yes and, and, and you're right on you know I think there, there's the part of I want to do this containerized thing but it's got to live with the rest of my ecosystem you know I mentioned um, containers are eating share from you know virtualized environments but the virtualized environments on the bare metal is not going away, right? You've still got the physical and the virtualized coexisting with these containerized environments. And I think that that's really what, what we have when you think about the Commvault portfolio between Commvault and Metallic. Um, you know, we've got our history with data protection, a very robust product. We've now got our BAS offering through Metallic. And then we've got Commvault distributed storage for the persistent volume. So it really is that, that approach of We've got the history and the legacy because these other things are also not going away, right? So your containers just kind of need to seamlessly slide in from an IT ops perspective of what you've been doing with everything else. And those solutions are available. I mean, if you check out our website, there is, you know, there's three versions available. There's demos. Uh, again, I'll go back to the education piece. It's really about helping businesses understand that, to your point, the traditional world isn't going away. It's an amalgamation of all these things going forward. So all you need to consider is really the nuances for containers while using an existing platform that can span across not just containers, but your the rest of your stuff, right? Everything else that you still need to worry about. And maybe just finally, did you find out anything or just anecdotally in terms of the customers? We, we've mentioned a lot about cloud. I mean, are a lot of them sort of looking to, if you like, hand over the problem to somebody else so that by you know, using software as a service or a you know, managed service, cloud service, they no longer have to, you know, scratch their heads and wonder what to do with these different you know storage environments they just say you store all my data and as long as it's there and i can access it when i need it job done yeah absolutely absolutely we're definitely seeing that you know and i think that that kind of gives credence to the whole cloud model anyway of just get it done for me 
Um, and so that, that's what Metallic is, right? So BAS offering its backup as a service. It's delivered with the multi-clouds. You can really pick and choose whatever you want, but the headache goes away of you having to worry about the complexities. Um, similarly, when we think about storage, our distributed storage architecture, same thing, fully programmable. You tell it what you want it to do declaratively and programmatically, it goes and does it for you. Um, and again, it's back to that, it doesn't matter what it is, tell me what it, like just point me to it and then I'll figure out the rest. I'll go crawl through, figure out what's there, what needs to be backed up, where your manifest is, where your secret keys are. You leave all of that to the intelligence of the software. And as a business or as a customer, you're protected by just essentially clicking a, clicking a box, right? And making sure that's done for you. Okay, and maybe just as a sort of final, any final thought, particularly, as you said, I think the survey ruled a lot of people are sort of aware of the problem or, you know, and maybe not so aware of how to address it. So you got, I don't know, one or two pieces of advice as to, so how, you know, the where they need to start in terms of the understanding and then coming up with a strategy. Yeah, I think education is key in this space. You know, there's so much information out there. A big part of it is connecting those dots. And, um, you know, I mentioned CNCF a couple of times. They're doing a, a fabulous job of bringing the community together, getting that information shared and trying to formalize it in a way that's digestible. So, you know, understand that while with any technology benefits, things change and therefore you need to think about what's changed and, and peel that cover back a little bit to understand what risk that might expose. So I think the first one is education, you know, get engaged, go to our website, go to CNCF, um, you know, involve yourself in the community and you'll learn a lot. And I think the second part is, is think about containers as like you said, Phil, it's yet another way of solving problems, right? So it's not going to live in a silo on its own. At any time, once you go through that, you know, the two inflections that I talked about between technology and maturity, we'll go through the shiny object piece and we'll get back to the same questions. I can't have a separate silo doing one thing over there. I don't get the economics. I don't get the efficiency. So think about that now, you know, plan ahead, see what we saw with virtualization. You know, container seems to be moving faster than virtualization adoption was, but it's a very similar trajectory, which is as a new technology, I'm going to on-ramp it and then it's like a whoopsie, but I can't leave that on its own, right? It's got to fit in with everything else that I do. And as there's more and more pressure on, on IT and operations teams with, with flatter budgets, think about that ahead of time. So plan your architecture by getting educated, knowing what your end goal is and how quickly your organization is going to demand that, that solution to be ready for them. So I think it's education, education, education. Um, and, you know, talk I mean talk to peers I think there's a lot of similarities that we're trying to see between verticals um, so certain sectors are trying to address the same problems they're held hostage to the same kinds of rules um, and really learn from your peers there's a lot of community development behind containers so so I think there's a lot of opportunities to leverage there. Well it's brilliant I mean we talked about a lot of uh, a lot of issues around the subject it's been great to chat so Gita thanks very much indeed for your time thanks. Thanks so much.